Hello, everyone. A very good evening. And welcome to this fourth and final talk in the series Science and the Local, being organized by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at ISA Bhopal. Uh, today, it is our pleasure to have with us Professor Sundar Sarukai uh, to deliver this talk. Uh, and uh, Sundar will be talking to us today about uh, cultures of mathematics and the local. So thank you, Sundar, for being here. Uh, welcome and uh, thanks to everyone uh, for being here. And uh, we have uh, a respondent to Sundar's talk today, who is uh, Dr. Rohit Holkar uh, from the Department of Mathematics at ISA Bhopal. Welcome, Rohit, and uh, thank you. So, thank you, Ansara, for the invitation. Thank you. And uh, so uh, with that, uh, I think I will hand over to my uh, colleague, Varun, who will uh, formally introduce the speakers. Uh, and um, uh, then uh, we'll uh, move on to Sundar's talk. So we look forward to a very uh, stimulating session this evening. So thank you so much. Varun? Yes, yes, Antara. Thanks, Antara. And uh, um, hello to Sundar and Rohit for uh, taking part in this conversation. And I also, um, I warm welcome to all the participants who have taken time to join this uh, lecture series. Uh, as Antara mentioned, this is the fourth and the last lecture that we have organized uh, uh, un uh, under the larger context of science and the local with the intention of exploring how science and its practice, its epistemology and various ideas about and various notions of science get formulated by the local configurations, the local context. So as uh, part of the series, uh, we have already explored um, how um, uh, astronomy has and its history has been taken, I mean, has been uh, differently looked at in different cultures. Uh, and Arun Bala was uh, trying to show us that aspect. After that, Madhulika uh, shared um, how uh, the um, different systems, like say in the Indian system, the, Ayurvedic knowledge, uh, um, medicinal practice is quite startlingly different from the modern biomedicine. And the last talk uh, that happened uh, on Monday this week was delivered by Gordon, who showed how Haldane's theories about biology and largely genetics were shaped by the Indian um, um, statistics, Indian logic, um, and uh, various other factors that shaped his ideas. So in this series, the last talk will be delivered by Sundar Sarukai. Um, and uh, let me briefly introduce him. So Sundar Sarukai is the founder of the Barefoot Philosophers, an initiative to bring philosophy to the public. He is presently a visiting faculty at the Center for Society and Policy at IASC Bangalore. He is the author of uh, the following books, Translating the World, Science and Language, the second book, Philosophy of Dimitri. The next one is Indian Philosophy and Philosophy of Science. And the following that is What is Science book, published by National Book Trust. Along with that, he has co-authored two books with Gopal Guru, The Cracked Mirror, an Indian debate on experience and theory. And, uh, and, theory. and the next one is uh, Experience Cast and the Everyday Social. He is the co-chief editor of Springer Handbook of Logical Thought in India and the series editor for the Science and Technology Studies series, Rootlet. Surak Sarukai was a professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies till 2019 and was a founder director of the Manipal Center for Philosophy and Humanities at Manipal University. His forthcoming book, Philosophy for Children, will soon appear in English and other languages. And uh, after that, I want to briefly introduce our respondent for today's talk, uh, Rohit uh, Holkar, Rohit Dilip Holkar, 
who is an assistant professor at um, uh, at the Department of Mathematics in Isar Bhopal. Uh, he has a PhD from University of Gottingen, Germany, and has done postdoctoral in several other several institutes like uh, the Federal University of Santa Catarina, Brazil, and later has joined Isar Pune and later did a postdoc in Isar Pune. Uh, Rohit works in operator algebras, which is a part of a broader stream of mathematics called analysis. His main interest is in the interplay between topology and algebra. He uses non-commutative objects in topology called groupoids for this study. Apart from this, he is interested in mathematics popularization in native Indian languages. He has written multiple articles and made videos for math, math popularizations as well. So I welcome Rohit as well. So the format that we will be following for uh, uh, today's talk is uh, Sundar will speak for uh, 40 to 50 minutes and Rohit will respond to that for five to 10 minutes. And later Sundar can add to Rohit's point and after that we can open the discussion to the other participants. So Sundar, will you um, start the lecture? Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Varun. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be part of this series. Thank you, Dr. Antara, for extending this invitation on behalf of your department. This has been a great series so far. Um, I think, you know, it has opened up new ways of thinking about science and other disciplines and the idea of knowledge itself. And I hope, uh, you know, people at Bhopal, uh, I mean, at your institute, your students and others who are interested in it, found something worthwhile to take home and think about it. Um, we, we started off with this wonderful uh, lecture by Arun Bala, where he set out some very important questions relating to the possibility of understanding science and in their practice in Asia, the Middle East and other regions with particular focus on astronomy. And Madhulika continued it by posing these questions about what constitutes knowledge in medical sciences particularly the Ayurveda. Um, and I think all of these, both of these were responding to the larger question of what constitutes scientific knowledge per se, and whether there is a kind of a plural approaches to these questions of knowledge in astro astrophysics, for example, or astronomical calculations, as well as in medical science. Uh, Gordon's uh, talk on uh, Monday brought a new dimension to it by bringing us to think about the questions of the tra transmission and circulation of ideas through with very specific questions of culture by looking at Marlon Nobis and uh, Haldane, largely Haldane's work within in India and the impact on uh, genetics and related fields in biology. So what I'm going to do is um, after having heard these talks, um, when I knew that these are the topics they were going to talk about, I decided I would want to focus on the question of mathematics. Because in a sense, mathematics is the last frontier for any questions related to ideas of scientific knowledge. There is a lot that science inherits from mathematics, inherits from the image of mathematics, including questions of objectivity, universalism, and so on. So to me, one of the most important ways to understand or to look at multiple possibilities of other ways of looking at science, for example, and to broaden the very idea of what science is, is to you know, uh, go and, as they say, bear the lion in its own den. And that is to go and look at the idea and the question of what mathematics is. So uh, that's the reason why I uh, thought that I would specifically talk about the very possibility of ideas of cultures of mathematics in the hope that this expression can catalyze thoughts about you know, plural ways of looking at mathematics in some sense. So let me share my slide, which I hope works. And uh, sorry, just a second. Yeah. Um, so, the first thing I want to start off with is the idea of universalism. And if there, is any, if there is any exemplar of the idea of universalism, idea of a universal system, it is mathematics. I, I, even in the workshops I do for children, 
if you ask them about mathematics or mathematical results or mathematical uh, you know the problems that they do in class uh, it's very, it's very surprising how stu the students i mean students right from school onwards seem to invoke some kind of universality to mathematical statements that there seems to be far less of a problem in them within them to accept the fact that mathematical statements are universal in the sense they are a cultural a special a temporal in that they do not depend on who is the speaker where it is being spoken from so a very classic example of course is that um, 2 plus 2 equal to 4 and the claim that we have taught right from school is that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4 for all people and for all cultures and in principle i presume it's true across the universe whatever that could, what the domain that could cover and the idea that there is this kind of a historicity and a kind of uh, universality to mathematical statements and it's therefore its association with questions of knowledge and truth makes mathematics the exemplar not just for ideas of uh, universalist thought within our own education systems and in our current society but also historically for western philosophy itself when the where the idea of modeling philosophy um is one that is based on the idea of modeling philosophy after mathematics in the in the guy in the structure of mathematics because there is something within mathematical truths which seem to guarantee a certainty to what it was what was being said and this whole question of a culturality and in a very important sense there was the removal of human interest from mathematical utterances and mathematical statements so this decoupling between the idea of the human subject and uh, so called objective mathematical knowledge makes mathematics an extremely important exemplar of the possibility of talking about objective systems and universal systems which is easily transferable across cultures so the independence of uh, mathematics from the human subject is also the independence of mathematics from cultural Uh, practices from cultural beliefs and so on so what we use for the example of 2 plus 2 equal to 4 simple arithmetic expressions are uh, then become extended to all kinds of complicated mathematical theorems and results and we know very well that part of the creativity in mathematics and part of the dynamism in mathematics is this constant creation of completely new disciplines with completely new practices and so on so there's a great plethora of um, mathematical objects mathematical operators theorems and so on and it seems to be as if that they all carry this um this this quality of being universal uh, a historical outside the human subject and culture one can extend this from mathematical utterances mathematical statements mathematical theorems to also mathematical objects and we know for example that one of the ways in which cultures are distinguished from each other is are the different kinds of objects which characterizes various cultural practices but what happens in the question of mathematics is not just are these utterances and claims about mathematical the statements true and independent of cultures but it is that the mathematical objects also seem to be universal that the idea of a number for for those in india would be the same as those in africa and those elsewhere so that idea that that there are when we talk of the universalism in mathematics that there are very different domains in which this universality is being manifested and exhibited ranging from the objects of mathematics which makes it common to everybody common to use the using them in very similar ways and also methodological that the kind of operations that you talk about the kind of arguments that you do the kind of inherent logical structures present in mathematical uh, operations etc or also also seem to be universal in a large sense and this is something which philosophers like wittgenstein of course are aware that there is something about mathematics which is so much about rule following following the kind of rules which are already inbuilt into the discourse in such a case we also recognize that rule following is also a kind of a universal given that what you do with these objects given the operations uh, etc uh, follows a particular kind of rule following which seems to be uh, quite universal uh, similarly that 
the claims of mathematical knowledge, mathematical truth, etc., are also universal. And most important, in a sense, bringing all of this together is the discursive structure of mathematics itself. And uh, unlike, for example, the differences in the kinds of discur discursive structures which you would find, let's say, in sociology or political science, which uh, mark the local, which locate the local in various different ways. Mathematical discourse seems to be completely indifferent to the question of the local, if we understand local in a very restricted sense. Okay, and I'll come to that point a bit later. Now, therefore, the question about this universalism in mathematics uh, is really something far more deeper about the nature of mathematics. Because you want to understand what is it about the numbers two and two, and perhaps uh, the operation which we don't talk too much about, the plus, what is it about these three entities that two plus two is always equal to four? What does it say about that? Why is it that one would assume that this makes sense for us unproblematically, right? And part of that is, uh, is you know, the, the ways in which one responds to this, both within the mathematical community and both in the way mathematics uh, the rhetoric of mathematics is developed is that all mathematical statements are true and that there's a universality of these mathematical objects like numbers and sex, sets, etc., and everything else which follows is that in some sense it is because mathematical, these entities are real and exist in some sense. So these entities, the existence of these entities, the processes relating to these entities are real. Okay, and we'll very briefly look at what it could mean by saying um, uh, that it is real. I'll come down to it when we look at the various aspects of the universalism of mathematics. So uh, the reason why this becomes a very important point, as I said, is that universalism in science is based on this aspect, that much of uh, science, the universalism claims of science are borrowed uh, because of its, uh, you know, cohabitation with mathematics. There's a lot of, um, you know, surrogacy involved in borrowing certain qualities of mathematics into that of science. And one of the best expressions, uh, one of the best uh, ideas which expresses this is the argument that mathematics is the universal language of science, something which is so popular right from early times, most well exemplified uh, by Galileo when he calls uh, mathematics as the language of nature. And even to the present day when we keep repeatedly seeing the descriptions of mathematics as the universal language of science. In other words, it's somehow that idea of all the sciences can be captured through this question of this language. And part of this, uh, by the way, was also a question we discussed after Gordon's talk with Vinita and Gordon had this very interesting discussion on the use of mathematics and biology, as some of you who are there might remember. In, but once you invoke the idea of mathematics as a universal language, you have to do it with caution because the, the analogy with languages is filled with a lot of pitfalls because the pro biggest problem is that languages are cultural. Languages are cultural pro productions. Languages embody and mark culture in so many different ways. Uh, but the moment you use language and mathematics in the sense, you have to be very careful in the way we uh, suggest the language aspect of mathematics. And, the, and, and what uh, Galileo does, of course, and what follows after that, uh, takes care of this by saying, you know, mathematics is a language, not of people, not of culture, not of humans, but of nature, whatever that thing called nature is, uh, which itself is a very interesting question, which is left unanswered in many of these discussions. But this also, the, uh, the, but, the, but what this also implies is that the question of translation which is so important and integral to the question of languages. In my view, translation is prior to the very idea of languages, the idea of the notion of translation um, makes this a very important uh, problem. And I think one of the best examples of seeing this tension between mathematics and uh, translation is, can be seen from the history of science. When, for example, uh, you look at uh, some, of the some of the major work done in early 20th century in physics, for example, and also in mathematics and chemistry, uh, were largely written in languages other than English, like in German and French and so on, Russian. Russia has also had enormous contribution, particularly in mathematics. Now, uh, what is very interesting, I mean, including some of the seminal papers of quantum mechanics, relativity, of course, uh, Einstein's papers and so on. Now, the, the interesting thing is, while there's been so much in translation studies on the problems of translating a text, let's say for a German literary text into English, and uh, translation studies as a discipline has invested so much in trying to understand how you move from one language to another. 
in the context of translating scientific papers, there is a great silence about it, as if the questions of translation uh, of Einstein's from German of his relativity paper into English has, poses no such conceptual problems. And part of it is because there is a hidden assumption that you know you may when you are translating Einstein, there may be problems when you translate the English parts of his paper into I mean the German language parts of his paper into the English part. But the essence of his work, the, the truth of that paper is captured in mathematical equations. And you do not translate mathematics. You transliterate, you carry mathematics in the German paper directly into the English paper. And therefore, it's, it completely annuls the possibility of what constitutes the various rich questions arising from translation and maths. Um, but there are various ways of responding to it. And my own early, the first work which I did on this began by looking at this question of this problem between translation and mathematics. Uh, but this idea of universalism in mathematics and the piggybacking which science does on this also has to recognize that there is a hidden tension between them. And that is captured by the fact that the science is a description of the empirical, whichever way you want to describe science. You can talk about the different subjects of science and the sub-disciplines of science, but in principle, at, at its heart, at its essential core, it is about the knowledge of the empirical, knowledge of the natural world, knowledge of the universe, whatever, whichever way you want to define these terms. But mathematics, right from the beginning, presents itself, particularly in the Western mathematical, the Greek mathematical tradition and the so-called Western mathematical tradition, presents itself always as the non-empirical and leading to a very interesting debate, as many of you may know, in Western philosophy between empiricism and rationalism, where mathematics is the domain of the rational, which is domain of thought per se. So all that you derive from mathematics are about the are processes of thinking, not about processes of the world and checking with the world. So now when we talk about the universal of science, which is borrowed from that of mathematics, can the, we will have to ask the question, how does the empirical become universal? Or where is the universal lodged within the empirical? That's again a very fascinating question, which goes back to this relationship between science and maths. And philosophically, it leads to very you know, basic problems within the way we understand um, certain concepts within philosophy. The, 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 the tension between the empirical and the universal is also the tension between the contingent and necessary. Very important uh, uh, you know, terms which, you know, which philosophers and logicians have spent a lot of time trying to define things like necessity and possibility, for example, in modal logic. It is also a very important uh, distinction between the essential and the accidental. And what the contingent and the accidental seem to uh, uh, point out is very simple, that the world need not be the way it is. The empirical world, the physical world need not be the way it is. The earth could have been different. There could have been different principles operating here. We could all have been different. We could all have been talking about language in a very different way and so on. But mathematical statements and mathematical truths are not like that. They are necessary. They are essential in some sense. And our task, I think, is to recognize what is it necessary of? What is it essential? What is it essential about? What is it about mathematics that uh, makes it necessary and essential, which therefore gives this very important uh, characteristic of, uh, of uh, universalism present in this. So one way to ask this question is to, uh, you know, take a step backwards and ask, is mathematics really universal? But the first thing to do before we even think of an answer to that is to ask, what is this thing called mathematics really? Hirsch's very well-known book, What is Mathematics Really? Uh, and variations of that are actually about a very simple question that it, the problem is not about whether it's universal or not, but the problem is that we don't have a clear question answer to what is mathematics. As I said, I, when I said there's no clear answer unlike science, it's because in science, I, I can say that science is a description, explanation, unification of the processes and phenomena of the natural world, for example. But in mathematics, what is it really about? And therefore, it is not a surprise that there are different views about mathematics much more than uh, one might one can do a parallel to science in some sense but again i must mention that some much of it borrows from these kinds of classifications about mathematics you could have a realist view on mathematics which is really a very important argument 
that mathematical objects and entities are real in a fundamental sense. And this is most strongly associated with Platonism, the argument that mathematical entities have an independent existence, except that their existence is in a, is a non-spatio-temporal universe. And this is something which has been held uh, very deeply by scientists and mathematicians across time. And when pushed to the corner and when people say, well, can you, how can you really believe in something like Platonism? Uh, and even if scientists tell you, well, it doesn't, maybe we don't believe in it or we haven't thought about it, it doesn't matter because the discourse of mathematics, the writing of mathematics betrays its, its commitment to um, realism. So this is a wonderful work by Hartree Field when he talks about the question of fictionalism, where we show that just the writing of mathematical statements is as if mathematical entities are real and they're as real as tables and chairs. And our description of mathematics is like my descriptions of tables and chairs. But that's not just the only way. There is a, there is a counter to the Platonist argument by the naturalist argument, which also moves much closer to the question of science. There is a very powerful structuralist argument about mathematics. They seem best as structural in terms of structural properties. A formalist argument, which I'll come back to later in the uh, later as we talk along, uh, which is also um, and also a little bit about the constructivist. So there are different types of these kinds of ways of looking at mathematics and the confusion about what really is mathematics is actually a very important part of mathematical practice and the fact that mathematics can be so creative and spreads so well. And if we try and say that, well, forget about all these kinds of views about whether mathematical entities, et cetera, et cetera, but can we at least accept it as a type of language, even though we may say language of nature, a special kind of language, is it even type of uh, type of language? But then uh, one would then argue that the kind of language that is invoked in the idea of mathematics is not representational. It is not meaning making in the way we talk about what are called natural languages, like spoken languages and so on, but it is symbolic. And therefore, mathematical uh, linguistic practices seems to be just a manipulation of symbols. But the, po the interesting point here is this, if I look at it in this particular manner, why should my creation of symbols and manipulation of symbols create these kinds of universal truths? Why is it that they should relate to the truths of the empirical world? And that remains, I think, one of the driving questions um, in philosophy of mathematics. And again, if anybody was thinking about the foundations of mathematics in some sense. In contrast, what I want to suggest is one way to respond to this question of universalism is to look at the growing body of work on pluralism. And although they do not, many of them do not invoke the very problematic term cultures of mathematics, which I invoke particularly for rhetorical and polemical reasons, um, there is uh, a very well developed uh, you know, amount of scholarship on the idea of pluralism. And pluralism, of course, speaks very closely to the idea of cultures. Um, which and because one of the defining aspects of cultures are that they are pluralistic and they exhibit great diversity and that's really what uh, we mean when we talk about in general as cultures. So when I'm invoking the cultures of mathematics, I'm invoking this image of the pluralistic traditions of mathematics which exist in uh, in communities of their own. I mean, in a world of their own, if you like. And one of the basic arguments of pluralism in mathematics by uh, by uh, work which I must say. Uh, much more than philosophers, very much driven by mathematicians and logicians themselves, very who are very interested in questions of foundational issues of uh, and questions of philosophy in mathematics, is that is a very simple observation by many of them that there is no one unique foundation for math mathematics, and they also point out just like we spoke about different types of universalism, universalism in mathematics coming from knowledge, from objects, from rules, etc. They also point out, as Michelle feels in her book. Uh, Sundar, uh, Sundar. Uh, Sundar, I don't think he can hear us either. I think, yeah, there has been. A... So you lost my sound? Yeah, Sundar, we lost you for the last 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, my thing went you off. You were talking about Field's book. 
Yeah. So uh, Michelle Field's book talks about, for example, uh, from a very mathematic, uh, mathematician's perspective and logician's perspective, talks about the types of pluralism which include um, in different types such as foundational and uh, pluralism in methodologies of mathematics, in the uh, truth structures and claims of mathematics, and uh, in questions related to math uh, truth in mathematics, particularly questions of um, necessary truth and so on. Uh, in the context of pluralism of foundations, Fields points out that, quote, insufficient, there is insufficient evidence to think that there is a unique foundation of, for mathematics. Several together inconsistent foundations of mathematics are what are actually present. And when you look at other kinds of pluralisms present in mathematics, it ranges from pluralism as perspectives. In other words, you know, there's not just one way of saying this is the best way of understanding this huge amount of mathematical production that is happening in the name of mathematics. It's not just one God's eye place where you stand and say, oh, this is mathematics. I know how to define it. Pluralism and methodologies, which are uh, which are very different across the different sub-disciplines of mathematics. And one of the points in methodologies and also a very interesting question, which I'll come back to very quickly later, is also that uh, the ide very idea of proof, which is very important both in science and mathematics, particularly for rhetorical purposes, uh, purposes is um, actually quite diffused in mathematics. Uh, if you look at mathematics as a collection of all these sub-disciplines. So the, the plurality of the idea of proof, of course, can be seen very simply from give, having simple proofs like we learn in school mathematics, which are analytical, and of course, much very important uh, mathematical results, analytical, but increasingly more computational results and the questions of diagrammatic uh, f f role in the for formulation of proofs are all extremely interesting, like in graph theory and so on. Uh, Fields also takes the or uh, takes the uh, you know makes a point that pluralism in success there is already in the definition of what constitutes successful mathematics because she says there are different measures of success in mathematics. Uh, Elman and Bell uh, again working from within the very deeply from within the, the the technical expertise in mathematics and logic give a very nice definition of why we need to think of pluralism. These part many cultures which inhabit mathematics. They, they point out that as soon as one asks questions concerning very basic questions, such as what is mathematics about, the question we began with, what makes mathematical truths true? Why should 2 plus 2 be equal to 4 be true? What is it about what that makes this somehow seemingly transparently true? So what axioms can we accept as unproblematic? And this you know, for example, particularly those who know Uh, Sundar, Sundar, we lost you again. Mathematical proofs can proceed. Sundar? And what if, yeah, you lost my thing uh, again? We, we lost your voice again. Uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, let me just turn off my uh, video if it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I, I spent maybe it's the evening. Really sorry about this. Um, can you see the screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, what they're pointing out is that when you ask, you know, you can proceed doing mathematics very well. And, you know, it looks like you're producing a large number of very interesting results and so on. And that's very, that's, uh, I mean, that's, um, you know, that's the nature of mathematical production of uh, uh, its discourse. But when you ask the basic questions, what are you actually doing when you are doing all this mathematics? Things become very contentious, and that's the point they're really talking about. And what they also point out that um, even the very central questions of what constitutes truth and proof is uh, if if you follow the questions of the ideas of truth and proof across the various practices of mathematics, including in the multiple sub-disciplines of mathematics, let's say ranging from real analysis to topology to differential geometry and so on, you will immediately find the plurality of multiplicity of approaches to these basic questions of truth and proof. I gave one example of how we can see it in proof, but uh, you know, you just extend it across different disciplines. Uh, but Davis also makes a very similar point, and uh, he makes uh, again coming from working as a mathematician, and he's actually moving towards pointing out something very interesting about uh, you know how uh, the, the, there are attempts to reach towards foundationalism, question from new work in category theory and so on. But 
but it's very illustrative to see what he says. The view that classical mathematics, constructive mathematics, computer-assisted mathematics, and various forms of fanatistic mathematics can coexist. That is the view which we call as pluralism in mathematics. That they coexist in the sense, they seem to make sense, they seem to be accepted as mathematics in some sense, although there is always a bit of a tension between some kinds of mathematics and some other kinds of mathematics, most notoriously the proof by computers, you know, um, and that has always been a bit of a problem. But uh, this, the, the fact that they all coexist and function as if they are different sub-disciplines of mathematics, already points to a very uh, dynamic pluralism present in mathematics. And what he basically says is in different frameworks, the answer to your question may be different, but this in no way implies that one or the other is right. This is the basic question in which he is talking about. This multiplicity and diversity, where you cannot adjudicate a foundational position from which you stand and say, I am right and all those other types of mathematical statements and utterances, theorems, results, etc., are false. And that is within the practice of mathematics, this is so deeply present. And this, this is very actually very interesting when you look at it in the larger claim of a very simple understanding of what constitutes universalism in mathematics. For Davis has correctly points out, as he says, quote, this position is strongly anti-Platonistic. Because remember that Platonism allows you one way to understand why mathematical truths are uh, uh, quote unquote objective or universal. That two plus two equal to four is true because there are these objects called two and two and that there is an object called four. And in this kind of a relation, that two plus two will always be equal to four. It reduces this. It is like talking about apple is sweet is true because whenever I eat an apple, it's true. It, uh, uh, therefore, it's actually very interestingly, uh, one can argue that it is actually an empirical uh, discourse. Mathematics becomes an empirical kind of an activity, uh, something which people like Penelope Maddy and other philosophers who try and relate mathematics and science talk about. Uh, but it, it is as if uh, instead of science talking about our physical natural world, mathematics is talking about the uh, Platonistic world. And the, the Platonist world is the, really one of the basic problems um, in, uh, you know, in much of a way, in our naive ways of understanding mathematics. And I'll give you a couple of very quick uh, ways in which uh, people have countered that. If Platonism, as I said, gives you a grounding for making sense of the kinds of universalism in mathematics, intuitionism challenges very really radically. And of course, in intuitionism, there are many schools ranging from radical intuitionists or more weaker versions of it. But intuitionism ranges from the fact that uh, but it's a, it's a constant, I mean, a recognition of the fact that mathematics is a mental activity and that therefore it is in some sense, uh, it's not human subject centered, but it is at least produced in that sense. But it goes far beyond this kind of uh, uh, so-called notion of reduction to, um, you know, subjectivism, but it, uh, it actually questions, questions very fundamental uh, logic, classical logical principles, and so on. It is also uh, related to the question of constructivism, where the argument is that existence proofs in mathematics and generally other fields of mathematics are uh, cannot be accepted because it is not a question of whether you can mathematically claim the existence of something, but that you should actually construct it in principle, in toto, to show that it can actually uh, exist or not. So this is particularly a challenge against uh, Cantor's set theory and the questions of transfinite cardinals and the ideas of infinity and so on. But there are a lot of very interesting work um, from intuitionism, which is also close. Uh, Sundar, uh, uh, sorry, but yeah, your voice. Uh... Sundar? Mathematics. Formalism is really uh, about... Sundar? You again lost me? Uh, yeah, yeah, for the last uh, 10 seconds. Oh, really sorry about it. I just don't know what happens. I, I told you this, it, this happens. Murphy's law with um, thing anyway. Um, yeah, formalism is about uh, a very a wonderful idea that mathematics is actually about playing around with uh, symbols. Symbols in the sense... Um, you know, these lines, you, how you uh, make, uh, you know, these kinds of symbols to stand for numerals and play around with them, etc. Basically, it recognizes its set of rule following with some kind of a, um, a written 
uh, written uh, writing apparatus, if you like, in a large sense. Okay, uh, we'll see a little bit more about it when I come to it. And the question of whether mathematics is a language, as we already talked about, and Hartree-Fields argument that uh, what describes uh, mathematics best is fictionalism. The argument that you know the that actually uh, two plus two equal to four is uh, should be seen at the level of evaluating fictional statements. If I remember right, it's been some time since I saw his book. Uh, I think it's something like Oliver Twist lived in London or something like that. Uh, it is it's statements like that. Fictional statements also make existent statements. It talks about people as if they exist and they perform various activities. And uh, fictionalism, uh, so the fictionalism about mathematics is that it is a set of stories and narrative about mathematical objects and what they do in the world, etc. So uh, there has been a very interesting attempt to, uh, you know, but fictionism has not really uh, become very dominant in ways in which people have understood mathematics. And I'll, I'll say why there's a particular reason for this. You can also look at the question of uh, plural, even if you look at mathematics as language, you can see the multiple diversity present even in just this view that mathematics is language. Because in what sense is it, uh, is it language? The pluralities are exhibited in the following manner. One, that mathematics is language of nature itself is very interesting. Two, if you look at mathematics as language, and that I think that argument is something which, which um, is very attractive because you look at a mathematical text, it is it's written like a text of like other of other languages, except there is some kind of a difference. All mathematical texts, including research papers in mathematics, will have a large amount of natural language, let's say English, just to stick with English. There's a large amount of English words, English expressions, English sentences, and then you have certain kinds of symbolic presence within that. So the, the, the very interesting question is that while this question of idea of mathematics as language is very important in the way uh, as, as a game or doing things with language. It is also the fact that there are different languages. Every subdiscipline of mathematics can be characterized as a different language. And uh, the way I uh, argued for this is that that you can see them, uh, you know, as similar languages, but very different. The languages of topology, the languages of differential geometry, the languages of calculus, they are they may look different. There may be methodological distinctions, etc. Uh, the objects which are dealt with are different, but they are connected as if they are connected through a family of languages, uh, which we know from linguistics very well. Um, there are questions related to the idea of mathematics and language, which is very deeply related to the questions of the way human uh, cognition occurs and the function of the body, leading to um, a growing field uh, at the intersection of philosophy and cognitive science called embodied mathematics, which raises the question of how mathematics that we produce is deeply related not to the mental structures of human thought, but actually to the physical structures of the human body. And it's very, uh, very, you know, uh, it leads to some very interesting questions. Um, I, if there are any questions or specifically on this, we can talk about it. And finally, uh, whenever we talk of language, we come back closer to the way we can understand much of language, which is as uh, rule following. Mathematics is rule following. Of course, you know, post Wittgenstein is a very popular uh, way of looking at it. And uh, I'll, I'll also say a little bit more about what the implications of the rule following are. Now, to give you an instance of how you could have these multiple diversities. So much of the debate on the pluralism of mathematics talks only about much of contemporary mathematics and what happens from 17th century onwards, for where a large number of this kind of mathematical structures were created. But I want to just very briefly show you how you can see this pluralistic traditions and the diverse traditions by looking at uh, examples of mathematics in different cultures. And uh, Arun Bala in the first talk already referred to some aspects of not just the Indian mathematical traditions, but also the Chinese mathematical tradition. For lack of time here, I'm not going to talk a lot about the Indian mathematical tradition. I just want to highlight some fundamental differences between the nature of this mathematics uh, and what we see as mathematics today. Now, one might again get into uh, nitpicking questions, whether it's really mathematics, whether they're doing mathematics, et cetera. But after listening for so half an hour to the idea of pluralism, I hope this question will not arise. The point is that, the, that there is something which is binds it in some sense, what we uh, think of it as mathematics. Because remember, till 16th century or so, uh, Indians had produced some of the most important results in mathematics. And uh, which went, as Arun Bala wonderfully points out, even in his book and in his talk, which uh, uh, circulates 
to the uh, Arabic world, to the, the Arabic uh, Islamic philosophers, and then goes into Europe. So there's a lot of very interesting work on this kind of uh, the nature of mathematics. And I'm using this to show, uh, just to illustrate how it is possible to think of such you know, great production of work in mathematics, but based completely on different presuppositions and foundations. So let me just list some of the basic questions which have been talked much about. And if there are any questions, we can specifically uh, talk about it. But I just want to illustrate this thing. One point which has been very well made, particularly by Professor Rodam Narsimha in his uh, work on the algorithmic and the axiomatic, and which many people have followed and written about, is the argument that Indian mathematics is fundamentally algorithmic and not axiomatic, like the model of uh, Euclid. So you have a completely different approach to the question of mathematics. Uh, it is, uh, which means you also see how, um, you know, the way it is written, the way it is understood within a cultural tradition is radically different. And I'll show you how it is radically different very soon. Uh, there is also the difference while well, you had a very rich domain of mathematics in India, which created not just the, the zero, the some aspects of the number system, very important results in trigonometry, algebra, indeterminate equations, and then, of course, uh, the pre-calculus uh, uh, part, which has been much under debate in recent times. But in all of them, you see that for all this work has been produced without using the kind of mathematics that are done today. That is, a representation of numbers is actually far more interesting. It is, um, it's not just symbolic, but it is through language. But it's actually a very interesting use of language itself. This is something which you can see in philosophical practice. For example, the Nyaya tradition, which tries to make language, quote unquote, if you like, more mathematical. But mathematics itself is, uh, is, is uh, expressed through language in very interesting ways. And I'll just mention very quickly uh, what that is, uh, what that is, what that would be like. And very interesting point about applicability. In a lot of uh, discussions in Western mathematics, it's largely the question of applicability is seen as separate from mathematics. And therefore, the very questions about the unreasonable, the surprise that mathematics can be used to model the physical world. And that surprise, the so-called unreasonable effect in mathematics, is never present in these Indian traditions because the question of applicability is fundamentally inbuilt. And therefore, this suggests that the foundational questions, the metaphysical questions of mathematics in Indian traditions do not have the kind of anxiety which the Pythagorean tradition, the, the Greek tradition had about things like irrationals. And uh, the question of negative numbers, it's such a fascinating study by David Mumford, which I'll say give you a little bit more uh, detail. So the question about irrationals, which made um, you know the whole question of what constitutes an irrational and the, the, how to how to understand objects like square root of two, uh, you know, that kind of an anxiety doesn't happen in Indian uh, mathematics at all, as we well know by many scholars who have written extensively on this by now. By in Surava Sutras, you have descriptions of the mathematical approximation of square root of two purely as uh, building devices. These are just, you're just calculating the simple question of how much should the length change if the area should double, and you then calculate it by approximation of square root of two without entering into questions of what kind of a creature is square root of two. And remember, for the for the for the Pythagorean tradition, its problem with this irrationals, it goes deeply into this idea uh, related to the metaphysical Greek ideas, uh, which are which are to do with finiteness, with the question of rationality and masculinity and the irrationality and femininity and the problems of the infinity that the Greek tradition has and so on. So there are, you know, many of these, these kinds of the burden of the metaphysics of mathematics does not seem to arise in empirical traditions like in mathematics in China, for example. And unlike again in uh, Western philosophy, where there is a great attempt, a great influence of trying to model Western philosophy and mathematics in Indian context, there is, seems to be very little discussion, a direct influence on philosophy. In fact, I find it very surprising that even the questions of what kind of an object is a number, again, which is such a big deal for Plato and post-Plato, Neoplatonists, and everybody else who follows, you know, what is this the entity, the beingness of numbers, does not just arise. They talk about sets in a very different context. They're not concerned about these kinds of questions about existence of sets and so on. 
And most importantly, unlike what people might want to believe, that there is no relation with theology, unlike Western mathematics, which has a long history of relationship with theology and religion uh, for various reasons, given its metaphysics related to Platonism. And here, no Platonism, no relation with theology. It just becomes a pragmatic measures of calculating for your daily lives, for practices of daily life. And that's a very interesting point. Again, I can't talk too much about it. But therefore, what I want to point out here is that there is this whole tradition of mathematics, which arises as the empirical, and that it arises through engagement with the world. And th therefore, unlike the idea, the Aristotelian idea of mathematical concepts arising as abstractions of physical phenomena, here, there is no question of the abstraction of physical phenomena. It's far more the other way, the, you know, well, let me not say too much about it under this particular question. Uh, in the case of, um, you know, a very clear instance of the relationship between cultures and the kind of mathematics that is produced, David Mumford uh, points out that, um, you know, in that in India and China, there was no problem in uh, understanding negative numbers and using negative numbers in your day to day social transactions, particularly in accounting, you know, debit, credit kind of a thing. And what uh, Mumford points out is that in Western mathematics, almost everybody, you know, till Fermat had a problem with negative numbers, try to avoid the use of negative numbers. He traces it, of course, back to Euclid. But uh, what happened in the Indian context is the acceptance of negative numbers for what they are without this larger burden of this metaphysical question of what constitutes, it's a, it's a larger burden of negative ontologies. And I think at some level, uh, you know, this is some work which I have to finish eventually, if at all I do that, that negative here is very closely related to the questions of, um, you know, other kinds of negative uh, ontologies, which are very well dealt with in Indian philosophical traditions, like the Nyaya and the Buddhists. So uh, it is not really, you know, I'm not surprised that the question of negative numbers is not a problem for Indian mathematicians at all. Uh, negative numbers led to Pell's equations, uh, you know, which were done much before they were called Pell in Europe um, as Pell's equation. And uh, Mumford also points out that since we know that, you know, in the case of the Indian context, astronomy dictated it. In, in, in a sense, it is like timekeeping of your everyday practices and rituals was a very important part of what dictated the growth of Indian uh, mathematics. And uh, although there have been great criticism about uh, certain aspects of Indian mathematics. One common one that there is no availability of proof. And we know from uh, work from people like, uh, you know, wonderful scholars like Professor M.D. Srinivas and others, that this is a completely mistaken argument because the, the texts, there is a culture of writing texts in particular ways. This is also the same case in the way Indian philosophical texts are written. And, to, uh, and, and you need to understand that text itself, which is doing something, a description of the world, can have different cultures of writing and presentations and representations. Um, what uh, Mumford therefore points out is that it's only in the 17th century, with much late in that, uh, from John Wallace and then with Newton, that negative numbers are accepted without this great existential angst. And part of the reason Mumford argues is because of Euclid's presence and the presence of imaginary numbers. But anyway, the, the larger argument um, is that there are different cultures of looking at what mathematics is in a foundational sense, which actually leads to different kinds of mathematical possibilities that arise. And I would, of course, for anybody who's interested in this and a set of many other wonderful pieces on uh, these kinds of questions in Indian mathematics, uh, please look at the studies in the history of Indian mathematics, which is edited by the well-known mathematician C.S. Shishadri. So if I want to summarize a particular kinds of cultures of mathematical thinking, um, you know, we could talk a lot about each one of them, but just to summarize it and tell you where these different, to give explicit examples of it, there are oral cultures of mathematical thinking, which are present away from mathematical uh, mathematics departments, uh, which uh, are present in the way children understand mathematics, in the way they talk about mathematics and think about mathematics. Uh, they are present in written, uh, you know, oral songs, which are uh, you know very interestingly present, and in fact, there's another place which I found very interesting is actually in music, and in the ways in which mathematical ideas, imagination plays such an important role in the production of music. And I would put it in the larger oral culture thing there. There are written cultures of mathematics, and as we saw, written cultures of mathematics 
depend upon what you do with different languages, different experiments with languages, mutating languages, and adding various kinds of things to languages. So the written cultures themselves are quite diverse. Then there is a symbolic, which is one part of the written uh, culture of science. Symbolic is just one part of the written culture of science, and that there are many different kinds of symbolic systems. And I'll say a little bit about it later. There is a culture of doodling of mathematics, where you sit and doodle without thinking that you're actually talking about platonic objects or you're talking about truth structures in mathematics and so on. Uh, some mathematicians, especially those who are very deeply involved in mathematics, some people whom I know, have talked about mathematics in an experiential sense. And they feel a very strong um, experiential way of doing mathematics and thinking about mathematics. It is formalized in different ways. For example, the experiential part of mathematics in embodied mathematics also leads to questions of pattern recognition, how you can actually, by looking at certain patterns, some people are able to see something and some people are able to see something else. And a completely different culture of mathematical thinking in opposition to larger traditional analytical methods of the numerical uh, uh, you know, type, uh, systems of mathematical thinking. And today, the digital raises very important questions about what is the what kind of mathematics is going to be present and what kind of mathematics are going to be created in a digital world, in an, in the so-called AI world and so on. I think there's some really exciting uh, work waiting to be done in that. And finally, the questions of ethnomathematics, which is Sundar. Uh, how even simple things Sundar, like that. Yeah. Uh, can you uh, start again from the ethnomathematics? Okay. Uh, we'll yeah. Lost so the, I said ethnomathematics has become part of a larger discussion on, um, um, you know, uh, questions of decolonizing mathematics and so on. But largely they become cultures of mathematics in that, that there are different ways, cultural productions of what one would call as mathematics. Now, when if somebody tells them that what you're doing is not mathematics, then the burden is on the person who is telling them what you're doing is not mathematics. Because if they turn back and ask, OK, so tell me what is mathematics and I'll take a call on it, uh, then it becomes far more uh, difficult. Because you will see um, when I come to this particular point, why that question becomes very important. Uh, there are different. So one way to look at how the multiplicity of mathematical cultures proliferate is by looking at the proliferation of mathematical objects. You may have started with arithmetic, with numbers, or with Euclid, with geometry, with points, lines, etc. But then you go along with all kinds of stuff. I'm sure Dr. Holker can tell us 100 other new mathematical objects which we have not heard of, which they are doing something with. And, uh, you know, and it'll be they produce not just these objects, they produce uh, mathematical operations in each of these domains. A very good example of uh, a contentious question in history of science, uh, but something which I think is very remarkable if people look into it very deeply, is the fact uh, is, the is the development of calculus. We know that in Western historical accounts that the history of calculus is often shown as a kind of a uh, you know, fight between Newton and Leibniz, etc. But uh, as many scholars <clears throat> like Professor Andy Srinivas and others have pointed out with the Kerala Astronomy School, that uh, the Kerala Astronomy and Mathematical School predates many of the early ideas of limits and infinite series uh, uh, in their own uh, construction of this calculus, the so-called pre-calculus or proto-calculus, much before uh, Newton and Leibniz, for example. Um, but there are there are many other things associated with it. It is not just to say that Kerala mathematicians are doing it, but the fact that they did a text without the symbolic um, uh, ease with, which is available to people like Leibniz. And Leibniz was a very important contribution of Leibniz as a mathematical uh, mathematician and philosopher was in developing the system of science and his deep uh, symbolic representations of mathematics, right? But there are great implications of these kinds of things. As C.K. Raju has uh, pointed out for many years and quite vocally, that this kind of models of calculus present from Kerala uh, school has many deep implications even on the teaching of mathematics and how we even understand the basic conceptual structure of calculus, for example. And finally, the point which I'm going to end with very quickly here in the next few minutes is that uh, is the argument about applying mathematics. And 
um, I think the application of mathematics is the one of the most important questions. It raises the question of what is mathematics to a completely different uh, kind of a question. And it is uh, it illustrates a very important question of a culture of application. There are different types of application. People who apply mathematics uh, across different disciplines. You can apply mathematics anywhere, any discipline. You take it and put it, and you can do something with it. But what the processes of application? There are no very clear-cut rules of saying, this is how you should take this set of mathematical objects and do it. The history of science is filled with such uses of mathematics. And each of them illustrate very well that the cultural, stylistic methods of application matter very differently in uh, different kinds of um, application. Now, one of the ways in why I think one should take this question of diversity and plurality very seriously is by just looking at this very simple question of symbols. And this is the, uh, the point I'll just try and end with, that the symbols in mathematics, if we accept that say, mathematics is a language with symbolic manipulation, I'm just taking symbols and manipulating them, we have to recognize that the creation of symbols itself is created through a very unique logic within mathematics. They just don't take whatever uh, symbols are needed. There are very important cognitive strategies present in the creation and the use of these symbols, which really converts the way we understand the diversity of mathematics, because this is a very creative process. In the Indian system, we knew that there are, I mean, we know that there are examples of numer you know, writing numerals and numbers, etc., in terms of um, language terms, but it's a very complex system, particularly the Katapayadi system, which, uh, which has been used in modified forms in various uh, Indian texts, but uh, they have a very different kind of a power. And we have to recognize that the symbols which we use today, as I said, are largely from the 17th and uh, more systematic only in the 19th. Even such a simple thing like the symbol of uh, pi is uh, as late as uh, you know, 1706. Now, my interest in this point is that the cultures of symbolic uh, use within mathematics points to something which is very unique and very important, which shows why pluralism in mathematics is so striking. It is not just about language, which is related to the question of symbol, symbols and meaning and so on. It is also represented, uh, it's also related to visuality. And this is a question which, is, which strikes every social science and humanities student who looks at a mathematics textbook and sees, you know, I don't know that I understand it or not, but uh, I can tell you that it is textually very rich. It's a very multi-semiotic uh, text. It has natural language words, it has graphs, it's diagrams, it has charts. And it raises a very simple question of what are they actually about? What are all these symbols about? If symbols are what represents and stands for mathematics, what are they really about? Are they just self-referential? Are they just squiggles which you make on the sheet? Or would you want to say that we are actually talking about a platonic world where every symbol that you create, every object mathematics which is represented as a symbol immediately stands for that object in a, platonist, uh, in a pl platonic world? But we know that the function of the symbols is far more than these. Function of the symbols is to give us new forms of cognitive capacities to create new mathematics. And a lot of mathematics in the sense works through pictorial cognition. It works through linguistic cognition. And the way in which it is written is a very fascinating aspect of how mathematics functions. And I'm just sure, I mean, I'm sure as mathematicians, you have seen enough of this as science students. But just to give you an example, um, taking the excuse that this is a department of social science and humanities talk, um, that you know, if you have not seen enough mathematics, here is the way mathematicians talk about their field. And I'm looking at it and wondering, what are they doing? What are they drawing? Why is this drawing so important? How can they communicate so much through these kinds of more and more fertile pictures? As Ronald uh, Chris in one of his uh, slides points out very interestingly, that the ways in which this representation happens in mathematics moves from tables to the, in, uh, to the late 17, in the late 1700s to graphs and then to compressed graphs of the, of the, the colored form that you see. And he makes a very interesting point that uh, in, in the earlier times, it was more quantitative. And actually, this kind of mature mathematical visualization has become more comparative and not quantitative. And just as an example of how this mathematical writing 
which creates a multiplicity of mathematics occurs is by if you look at the way in which mathematical um, things are written which i have called as alphabetization in mathematics in my book translating the world where i look at many such examples you just look at them and ask why do they write uh, you know they are writing about homology and cohomology groups why are they writing something h and super script q bracket d subscript 8 um, you know and then you put a semicolon z and then cover it with a bracket these practices of writing are very important they indicate the fact that this particular symbol uh, hq uh, that particular group structure refers to your particular groups refers to your particular entity but it is this a uh, multiplicity of this which really makes mathematical pluralism very vibrant and the last point therefore i'll do with this so that i end here uh, is that this is best expressed in the problem of applicability of mathematics we could say that mathematics is just about symbols we could just say there are multiple foundations why are people still then um inclined towards thinking of mathematics in universalistic terms why would they associate questions of foundational truths with mathematics if there is one fundamental reason it is this question of applicability of mathematics in the sciences and the great logician from and mathematician frega uh, expresses this wonderfully when he says that it is applicability alone which elevates arithmetic from a game to the rank of science the fact that you are applying these kinds of mathematical uh, symbolic representations this diversity of foundations and objects and operators into the description of the world into prediction and opening up of a physical world which we do not have access to otherwise and this is what um, repeatedly people have referred to as the mysterious effectiveness of mathematics and the the problem about the mysterious effectiveness of mathematics as i have been talking about is that we have really misunderstood the nature of mathematics for platonism uh, applicability is mysterious but with the different multiple uh, practices of mathematics we know that it is not necessarily the case and that the framework for explaining uh, this applicability and this mysterious effectiveness vanishes if we give up on some of these Uh, uh rhetorical and polemical claims of universality of mathematics without taking into account the complete richness of its uh, its its processes of creating mathematical objects rules operators and uh, all of which are of course moderated by the master symbol the equal equal to sign but independent of that there is this great complexity of it which is present and uh, that opens up i think very important and interesting ways of understanding what applicability is and how to make sense of mathematics um even as a, a, a discipline independent of science i'll stop here thank you so much sundar thanks for the uh, fascinating talk uh can i uh, call upon now rohit to respond to this talk uh may i warn yeah please please go ahead oh yeah sure i would say it was a very interesting talk because uh you see we we usually discuss about the nature of mathematics its applicability and uh, how it is related with uh, the the day to day world that we have however uh, in when sundar discussed it when he has really gone into details and bits of pieces of the this translation and the nature of mathematics so it was very impressive to uh, hear it now uh, i just made certain points which i would like to uh, cite and uh, a few doubts which i have uh, namely so the first comment is that uh, this universality of mathematics in sciences uh, is a very interesting point i would like to cite a few more examples uh um, so i i particularly like the idea that uh, uh what universality should mean in sciences is an idea which is possibly uh, originated from the universality in mathematics that's very fascinating to think about because it seems very plausible also that in mathematics usually people like to generalize the structure you give one particular uh, structure Uh, and then people would like to think about you know what happens if you reduce a few more actions 
and one keeps going into generality wherein the universality comes into picture the simplest example which i usually tell in my classes uh, is that uh, you see when one looks at the newton's laws uh, when one looks at the newton's law of gravitation and the gauss law of electric intensity the nature of both the laws is same it says that a certain quantity is directly proportional to a cons uh, is directly proportional to rate of change of something and the constant comes into picture so if you look at the equation for electric intensity and the gravitational force at a point then mathematically they are the same structures as a differential equation they are the same thing and then what mathematicians would think is solving this equation will solve both the problems for me so you see that's the universality in the idea <laughs> or on the other hand if you take the newton's laws of motion and then if you take many equations in electric intensity uh, uh, current electricity uh, they have different meanings but uh, all of them are same as set of differential equations it's basically first or second order differential equations and solving this first or second order differential equation at once solves the problems in kinematics as well as uh, electronics and uh, much more uh, many other subjects also so that is an interesting uh, really per, a very different perspective that how the universality in mathematics gets reflected in other sciences and then people talk about more general which is kind of universal uh, secondly the translation between mathematics and uh, sciences or i would say mathematics and uh, the nature uh, whatever that is <laughs> is again a very interesting topic uh, a very very favorite example of mine in this case is uh, the banach tarski paradox uh, which says that you can take a small pie and cut it into small pieces finitely many rotate them in place and when you put them the volume is like equal the volume of the earth or something like that so you know this theorems are very popularly discussed on internet and popular science but that's basically the translation part abstractly you have proven something and then how will you interpret it uh, so certainly that is definitely a kind of problem and a thing one has to ponder upon and think about how these results should be translated and not just for the sake of translation but also because abstract mathematics has grown so much in its nature by now that at some point of time even people would wonder experts wonder about what is the meaning of certain theorem that we have in hand uh, is it even worthy uh, worth discussing or uh, secondly this incompleteness theorem of jeidel again its interpretation is uh, very interesting as a theorem one just takes it as a fact we don't uh, really think so much about it but its uh, applicabilities are very different uh, its, its translation in real world is uh, impressive shocking multiple feelings are involved in there when it comes uh, and uh, yeah so uh, regarding the translation my own observation however is that uh, you know when we make a mathematical model uh, usually if we uh, i personally think we approximate the actual situation the simplest example is uh, a straight line in euclidean geometry is supposed to be straight it never bends whatever that means on the other hand uh, as physics proves again using mathematics that you can't have such a straight line so what i many a times feel is that when mathematical models are made the hypothesis or the axioms are approximations to the real situation uh and that could be the place where the discrepancy could appear that one has some mathematical result which is based on certain axioms uh hypothesis and the hypothesis and axiom they might have some loophole uh somewhere due to the approximative nature due to which a translation may be problematic uh when it goes to a very abstract sense uh and finally uh, regarding this uh regarding the discussion of indian style of mathematics and indian culture of mathematics yes this is uh, this is very uh, impressive to note that the writing style in indian mathematics is different we don't go in the axiomatic method even in leelavathi most of the nature, most of these texts are written in uh, verse uh, they are written in verses and not in symbols as modern mathematicians do uh, due to which they are lucid uh, also the applicability of this 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 mathematics that many of the problems are real life i mean uh, in leelavathi itself many problems are very realistic in nature something breaks down, uh, someone's mala breaks down the uh, the beads come out and then one has to compute those beads or some other problems wherein uh, 
examples like one of my favorite problem is there is a lotus flower and wind comes and then it bends down then uh, bhaskara gives um, i think certain length the length of the um, steam of this flower and then he asks uh, when at what angle it will touch the water uh, and even in when it comes to the kerala school of mathematics especially their calculus the problems are very uh, applicable in the nature itself they are trying to answer a particular problem rather than developing an axiomatic theory which will address two general problems uh, and i think in uh, one of the texts i read uh, this hindu mathematics by bibhuti bhushan uh, datta if i'm not wrong uh, he also mentions that in quadratic uh, finding uh, bhaskara when he was attempt his attempts to find the roots of a quadratic uh, he he doubts that it may have uh, uh, connections with the bookkeeping of merchants namely merchants wanted to cal calculate uh, interests on the loans they have given and that could have been the need wherein bhaskara entered the business of calculating roots of a quadratic polynomial because such a quadratic comes into picture when you want to calculate uh, certain interest rates so the applicability is certainly there uh, but like two questions pop up in my mind uh, sundar the first is namely uh, this dispute Uh, as you mentioned that uh, it is certainly a fact that westerners uh, had a hard time in digesting negative numbers and irrational numbers and they had a fight uh, i mean literally like Pyth pythagoreans had a fight over it i mean uh, people doubt they could have even had bloodshed so uh, but we don't see such uh, such a problem in indian culture of mathematics uh, i i personally i mean my doubt is that is it because we don't have enough of documentation about it uh because in kerala school of mathematics or in bhaskara or uh, aryabhata's work we don't see uh, you know unlike shrine we have certain shrines of goddesses and then the tradition just comes as mathas unlike that we don't see this particular tradition of logic mathematics uh, descended into uh, not really mathas but it is carried forward and commented upon so could that be a reason that we don't see such a uh, thing because yeah that's that's the thing and uh, secondly regarding applicability uh, this is certainly a fact as i said that most of the rather most of the mathematics which indians developed it is applicable in its nature itself the problem the verses they themselves explain it uh, however is it uh, is it not because it's uh, the present mathematics that we see is very involved and complicated whereas this 400 year mathematics has its origins in 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 very basic applications okay the applications which we think are basic nowadays but not for uh, possibly uh, the society 400 years ago the present mathematics mathematical problems are more complicated in nature because as you mentioned we are dealing with ais and more involved problems quantum computing and so on so the nature of the nature of mathematic automatically for this generation uh, has become abstract so these are the two doubts which i came in my mind and um, yeah but i just have one comment before i quit uh, it's about notation so i i personally feel that there is a lot to talk about how we write mathematics why there are symbols and so on uh, so one thing about writing mathematics i feel is that um, i mean usually non mathematicians talk a lot about the symbols which we use but i feel that the symbols uh, you know usually mathematicians don't bother about the symbols usually a symbol is related with a certain idea you have a set of ideas for example the cohomology or homology group and the symbol just represents a particular idea it's equal abstractness for me when i say i'm happy i write i'm happy the word happy does not really have a meaning it just express it just uh, quantifies a certain abstract notion that i have and some symbols are developed uh, for bookkeeping a very famous example is gauss modulus notation 3 mod 6 uh, uh, so 3 3 parallel so you write three parallel lines and then write this modulus notation right it became very popular because uh, it simplified the calculation so much that many questions could be formulated elegantly uh, so yes like the symbols are there but i would rather say we are more focused on ideas and when it comes to expressing the ideas like the words people coin some symbols which later possibly become like so widely accepted but anyways when it comes to getting uh, like inventing symbols to be frank 
yes, one has to ponder a lot if it clashes with something else, if it represents the idea. Anyways, I, I, I'll stop here. Thanks a lot for the wonderful talk. Roy, thanks for this talk. Uh, Sundar, you want to quickly respond to Rohit? Yeah, thank you so much, Rohit. Um, you know, I think you have obviously a much deeper understanding of mathematics, as you are saying. And so I'm very glad that uh, we found something uh, to talk about. Uh, you know, just very quickly, this part, I think you made two very important points about that the universality in the sciences comes through questions of generalization. The, the, the mathematicians attempt to move towards generalization once they talk about one particular concept. That is very much true. And also the question of the axiomatization. But what is also very interesting is that uh, it's not, not just to the fact that Indian mathematics is not axiomatic, but if you look at a lot of uh, production of uh, science, for example, neither is science axiomatic. And in fact, that's far more very interesting that that's much right. before axiomatization of anything. In fact, it seems to be the case that axiomatization is quite irrelevant to the application of mathematics. Uh, I mean, application mm -hmm. of mathematics in the sciences. Yeah, we, mm -hmm. we know the very good examples from real analysis and so on. And in fact, mm -hmm. today, uh, or even uh, attempts to uh, axiomatize, um, you know, non-Euclidean mm -hmm. geometries and stuff like that. I mean, even today, I don't know of uh, science students, um, you know, or professional scientists who actually have any clue about the kinds of axiomatization questions that happens in mathematics or in logic, because they don't just don't figure it at all. And that's why the question of these cultures of applicability I keep talking about. And, you know, as a, as a mathematician, you'll really recognize that uh, a lot of very important science physics has been done with wrong usage of mathematics. Mm -hmm. For example, very good examples are about how the exponential function was, um, you know, metaphorically used in early quantum theory from e mm -hmm. to the power of x to the shift operator e to the power of d, that is d by dx, and then e to the power of a when uh, matrix mechanics was used, you just started with e to the power of a and you had the series expansion for e to the power of a. Although mm -hmm. it is formally not allowed when a was mm -hmm. a matrix to do something like this, you know, so some True. formalization True. comes afterwards and in True. terms of what, how they have been able to use. And this mm -hmm. is why I feel that, um, you know, this question of symbolic notation is so important. I, I have a feeling it's true for maths also, but definitely in the context of applied sciences, I can I feel a little more confident in saying this because we again have very good examples. When you look at uh, tensor notation and the mm -hmm. great, um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I made a great change to relativity theory. The possibility yeah. of doing relativity completely changes after Einstein's understanding of the tensor notation through mm -hmm. Minkowski and others. I mean, the point is that it, the, it, there is something in tensor writing which captures mm -hmm. such profound simplicity and pictorial cognition. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have been doing so much of a vector uh, multiplication, you know, two vectors, mm -hmm. V dot, the dot product, uh, let's say V mm -hmm. dot V equal to V squared, scalar. But then you do it in terms of tensor notation and you write as view subscript mu and V, uh, uh, you know, superscript mu. There's a cancellation mm. of the superscript and subscript. Mm. It seems so trivial, yeah. but it's so powerful. And this extension of these things, which have completely revolutionized mm. major scientific work in relativity, quantum theory, etc., makes us un uh, probably think about the, the role of symbols and the mm -hmm. fact that mm -hmm. cognitive capacity is associated with the doing of mathematics. Uh, the main point is whether all the mathematical objects that you create in your field and use symbols. Uh, the, the symbols are not, you know, it's, it, it, let me give you an example. It's almost like um, words. Sometimes people would, do, there was a tradition, traditional theory of, of language which said that language just represents the world, you know. Mm -hmm. There is a world, I just use words to talk about the things which are there in the world. But then one of the things we recognize about language and the greatness of language, idea of language, is its amazing multiplicity from this representation. Yes, I do mm -hmm. use words like chess to point to the object. But once I have a set of words, I produce novel sentences and novel words, mm -hmm. I mean, novel language terms, which go far beyond the world it is taken from. Mm -hmm. And uh, my own feeling is that symbols do this object very much in the context of, uh, you know, mathematics. The difference between mm -hmm. words and uh, symbols, of course, is that words are filled with meaning, 
and the symbolic thing what you do with the symbolic is you remove meaning out of symbols uh, mm-hmm. but to me the removal of uh, meaning out of symbols is actually uh, uh, is equivalent to putting all meanings into the symbol mm-hmm. so that's a zero infinity correlate removal of meaning is actually allows it to take on any meaning it wants in any other different context mm-hmm. so it, there is something very interesting um, going here which is what you know i would argue and that's mm-hmm. part of my work which has been to show this argument so i i do agree with you that uh, you don't bother with symbols maybe consciously but it mm-hmm. has a great implication for the kind of results one is able to produce and uh, finally the point about square root of 2 uh, a very interesting point whether there was because it's no documentation but in the case of square root of 2 for example it's very clear or even for the negative numbers mm-hmm. that there is documentation we have the sulava sutras which give you very clear mm-hmm. account of the approximation for square root of 2 and in the mm-hmm. context in which it is used so i mm-hmm. um, i think there were uh, yeah this is an interesting puzzle i don't know if it's because of lack of text or lack of translation of some of the text but why does mathematics and these questions of mathematics don't seem to matter to the philosophers even though they had produced such high level mathematics mm-hmm. uh, there is some kind of a deeper question one answer to that of course the fact that it's not platonistic is one answer but also because indian philosophy's strongest point along with logic was its philosophy of language uh, mm-hmm. uh, which western philosophy kept, ca- catches up only in the 19th and 20th century mm-hmm. so given the fact not just from panini but to the grammarians the philosophy mm-hmm. of language was so deep and central to all these kinds of philosophical thinking that the uh, mathematics never became um in that sense a topic mm-hmm. of worthy of fighting over or things mm-hmm. like that perhaps you know but that's uh, yeah. it's a very important question thank you so much for your uh, comments um with this um, discussion um i would um we can have uh, the participants raising questions with sponsors uh so i would request the participants to raise hand and uh, accordingly i can go one by one and give you the i mean like you can speak and ask your questions so can i request the participant to uh, raise your hand if you have any questions so uh yeah kaushik can you go ahead and ask your question hi sundar Um, so uh, one question i had was about elegance in mathematics uh, and the the importance it seems to have in the way mathematicians understand themselves um and i suppose one way to make sense of it is to push it into the experiential that there are conventions that decide what is and is not elegant you know minimalism for example economy and so on uh, and so you would understand elegance the way you would in other domains like let's say music and poetry and so on uh, but it also seems to have and here i'm thinking a little bit about what g h hagi said about ramanujan and so on uh, it seems to have truth value for mathematicians yeah. uh, and as hagi said beyond a point these equations had to be true simply because you know on the lhs if you have a scramble of things and on the rhs it just says pi you know something that is such a beautiful deduction just cannot be a lie so how do you look at this in any of the frames which you've set up for us uh, that's one thing i wanted to ask you about the second is um this is actually a question that goes back several years since i've been in your classroom and so on like it seems to me you're always fascinated when there's an by distinctions that are absent in the indian tradition in comparison with the western so for example that the nyaya syllogism doesn't worry about the analytical difference between truth and validity that somehow it's not an issue for them or that uh, you know irrational numbers root of minus 2 it it's it's you see it as a pragmatic virtue that it doesn't bother people in certain traditions as long as it helps you run your shop you know and this is the part that kind of worries me where sometimes i think or you know perhaps i've misunderstood what you were saying uh, do you think are there you know or are you aware of um contexts where these things are seen as outliers that call for inquiry and therefore perhaps open up a new dimension or perhaps i'm simplifying what you've said uh so sorry you know, kaushik i just lost you after the differences oh. in indian thought just two lines i lost oh, okay 
No, certain things, certain distinctions that are absent in Indian thought yeah, fascinating correct. precisely because they are absent. Yeah. Uh, because even let's say root of minus two, for example, you can imagine two kinds of mathematician, one who would really be paralyzed by it and worry about it in a metaphysical sense, because it's an outlier to you know, the system of thought one currently has. And the other who says, you know, as long as it has pragmatic value, as long as it helps me run my shop or build a house and so on, what's the problem? And somehow for me, you know, the ability to pose the question as a problem has always seemed to be the good side of the divide. It's important to worry about these things. And for you, the uh, denial of the problem or the pragmatic, you know, assimilation of that problem is the more important side. So I was wondering if you could talk a, a little bit yeah. about this as well, in addition to the first thing about elegance in mathematics. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Kaushik. Um, you know, I think the second question, um, no, I'm not saying I prefer the pragmatic over the metaphysical. I'm saying that there is this difference. And again, it's not even that I'm saying that that's better mathematics or worse mathematics. I'm just saying when people talk of universalisms and universality of mathematics with one foundation, with one type of doing it, etc., I'm just using these kinds of Indian mathematics or Chinese mathematics as counter examples. And that is why I focus on the difference to show what it is, how is it that they are different and yet they produced some of the world's greatest mathematics of their times, right? So it is just to show that the possibility of multiplicity okay. without saying, because there's the, it's so difficult, the starting point itself is difficult because they don't get the point that the mathematics can be plural. So it's an empirical result in that sense. But uh, if you really push me, like you always do, I guess, whether I want to accept that square root of two metaphysically thinking about it is a better thing to do than just pragmatic. Uh, you know, I think doing philosophy, I would of course want to go towards the more foundational questions, which I think is far more clarifying about that, right? But I think there's a lot more happening here with the question of numbers. Numbers itself, uh, you know, there is a whole historical discourse around what numbers are before we even come to the square root of two. So um, there are these questions about what, what are numbers, how should they be constituted? I'm not saying that the Indians don't have a theory of numbers. They do have a theory of numbers. They have a theory of plurals also in terms of perception and so on. I'm interested in the fact how they're uh, in, a, in a, because I think all knowledge is inherently hegemonic in character and it tends to occupy other spaces. You know, it's like the big brother. So I'm interested in seeing how uh, there are other possible knowledges which are available. Can there be, uh, because everybody says this can, uh, you can say all this theoretically, but are there examples of this? So it's only in that context that I was uh, talking about it. But I really think the question of what is a number is, uh, or what could be the square root, et cetera, are very interesting uh, theoretical questions. And it, it is a surprise, as I said, that it doesn't seem to matter much to Indian philosophers. But I think that's my own reading is because of their engagement with language, which is very different, right? Mm -hmm. um, the question about elegance and mathematics, yeah, of course, it's one of the pet topics of mathematicians. And they have made such a big virtue of uh, elegance and beauty that the re one of the first responses to the use of computer proofs or methods of computer and proofs like in graph theory, the color, uh, four color problem, and also the, the famous Euler uh, thing, you know, this um, um, fifth degree thing, a to the power of five plus b to the power of five plus c to the power of five x is equal to e to the power of five. The solution, the fact that there's no solution to it was shown to be wrong by uh, just simple computation. And uh, mathematicians have always looked down upon that kind of doing mathematics uh, because they don't think it's elegant, etc. And there is this old preoccupation of the question of truth and beauty, very platonic again in that sense, goes back to this long tradition of this. But it is also of deeply influence in science. And the most famous example is Eddington's uh, claim that uh, theory, uh, Einstein's theory is true, not because he experimentally proved it, but because it was so beautiful that it could not be false. And of course, people like Dirac and Hardy's very famous claim that uh, some of his most useful mathematics was to him the most useless because it is not the most beautiful. The truth is somehow present in there. The, the idea of truth is actually not just about the aesthetic element. There is also a moral element of disinterestedness. Truth comes because it is not useful. And that 
you because you may add value to something which is useful but how do you add value to something which is absolutely useless and this value which you add the disinterestedness right which also becomes a kantian theme for aesthetics is a very important point i think in which they are uh, deeply dealing with but I, with all this you know i'm not even taking on the much difficult much more difficult question about how is it that the aesthetics of nature are very often expressions of mathematical symmetries and very deep mathematical structures you know that raise, that makes this whole question of what is mathematics into a completely different domain um aditi you want to go next uh yeah sure i'm uh, my question is pretty similar to one that koshik just asked and um i suppose um and uh, i suppose i'd start with the point of applicability and um this insistence i'm not saying that you have it i mean the insistence mm -hmm. that we have um, um on the applicability of science, of of mathematics um to the world and um you, we were talking about you were talking about the dealing of um mathematics and philosophy that uh, was present in indian mathematics and which was uh, certainly not the case with platonism and the sort of philosophy and mathematics that developed from there but um i i i think that there is still a problem if we so closely link mathematics and science really and so the question that you brought in of um you know mathematics uh, will stop will, will be less of just a game and more of a science you know i i don't know if i'm quoting it correctly so um i don't know it it sort of you know made me think that if we if we start thinking about mathematics in terms of applicability we'll have the problem that for example 17th century science had of inverse world where uh, it's it's just a question of um what what will explain the phenomena best right that that mathematics is the one that you know is 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 the one that we should choose and um and then that links to the problem of you know philosophy of language and i i only know it from the western tradition of russell and frege and everybody but again this this whole issue of of uh, making sense you know that that language sort of seems to contain within it also i think would limit uh, mathematics uh, in the sense that uh, and, and i think you brought up music you know like very sort of uh, in, in bits and pieces here and there and i thought that it might be better to think of it as structured like music and again the question of play versus science and i feel that you know when we we are thinking about the history of mathematics if we delink it from philosophy and if we don't think of um onta of mathematics at all if we don't think of you know the puzzle of what the onta of mathematics is and i'm not saying we need to go to platonism you know we can think of platonism nominalism we can think of all that debate and we can add new debates now um i i think there is something that will that will hinder the the sort of the play in mathematics and the history of mathematics so i, I was just wondering what you what you make of it because in very fascinating talk but i was wondering you know uh, how you would think of the how mathematics has progressed i was thinking of it in historical terms yeah <clears throat> thank you so much aditi i think you know very important point you raise um I, i i agree with you that you look at mathematics okay so first of all uh, the linking between mathematics and philosophy has always been part of the practice of mathematics in the development of early mathematics i mean um, in the development of modern mathematics right up to leibniz leibniz is a classic example of a mathematician philosopher who writes his major text on philosophy but deeply influenced by certain questions of uh, representation of mathematics creating a language his famous argument for uh, universalis characteris you know the universal language which would uh, which would be able to allow you to do the same kind of language for things like mathematics and metaphysics and so on Uh, and he, he also produced mathematics his work on calculus has endured more than I, uh, newton's uh, you know symbolic notations for calculus and so on so that continues with cantor that continues till 18th 19th century it continues then with hilbert and then with godel in the 20th century so there is uh, i think within the mathematical community at least for the uh, very important uh, seminal there the people who were very famous mathematicians they have always been engaged with this foundational question so i think it's an internal question itself and not one which is really posed by philosophy community as such in fact i think uh, in this sense philosophy has largely been 
uh, playing a backseat and a kind of uh, following the leader kind of a thing. Um, you know, we can it can manifest in so many ways. For example, with Spinoza's writing his ethics in terms of mathematical structure of theorem and so on, right up to uh, later uh, philosophers who try and model some of the basic questions of philosophy on the fundamental presuppositions of mathematical knowledge, ideas of mathematical truth, and so on. So, yeah, but when these mathematicians in their practice are raising these questions, they are raising it, and I think that's the reason why I think it's so important that they are raising it because the kind of concepts they are thinking about already naturally force them to raise a question about, what, for example, in the Leibniz case, how do you actually define an infinitesimal? What does it actually mean to talk about something going, a quantity becoming as small as zero as required? And its relationship, of course, to the questions of uh, infinity and so on. So I think uh, there is that kind of a, a process which is happening there uh, in terms of the questions they raise. The applicability question has become uh, far more important. And I think Frega is, uh, you know, right in the context. I mean, the context is that he's saying that, for example, if you look at chess games, you can also have theorems in chess. So, for example, there are positions which you can never win, or there are very clear winning positions. And those, they can be written as theorems in chess. It will tell you if there is a rook and uh, how, a knight, you will, well, you know, you will win, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, the point is theorems in chess, which are like these mathematical theorems, if you like, uh, which start from this particular position and come to a particular result, are not uh, are not in any sense applicable to the real world like mathematical theorems are. And I think what Frega was pointing out is that what makes mathematics more than just this game of rules, rule following, and following the rules coming to certain results is somewhere there, uh, you know, their connectability to something real. And that's an interesting question because either you connect to the platonistic world and you have a, a you know completely real description of a world, which is a, a platonism, or you try and connect it to the real world and say that mathematics has a natural connection to the description of the real world, the physical world. And so that's also something which uh, comes again, as I said, from the kinds of questions of, uh, uh, you know, the applicability. Uh, in the, the question of unreasonable effectiveness is phrased by Wigner uh, in his, um, you know, in his very famous paper of the title. And in that, he, as he points out, he says, I'm doing some calculation of some population distribution. And then suddenly I get a pi, an expression of pi in my expression. And I'm like totally puzzled. Where does pi fit into this question about, uh, you know, some distribution problem? Because pi is supposed to be related only to a circle, a geometric figure. And with that, you know, he's raising it, the stakes of what it means to use mathematical language to this. One answer to this, which is a semantic answer, which Steiner has done, and I've written a bit about this, is that we should not think of the application of mathematics as applying to the real world. It is Mathematics is always applied to another language. So just like saying there are many apples on this table, if I write there are uh, 10 apples on this table, what I have done is I have applied mathematics, in this case numbers of 10, not to the description of the uh, many apples on the table, but actually to the description of many as an English term. And therefore, this reference of mathematics, not to the word, but to other linguistic descriptions, gives us a completely more useful way of understanding this larger question of applicability. Um, yeah, I'll just stop here because you can go on about it, but we should continue. No, no thanks a lot. In fact, yeah, yeah they're, they're big, I could go on asking more, but I'll just yeah. stop here. So, thank <laughs> as you. well. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. um, Jobin, you want to go next? Yes, sure. Hi, Sundar. And Hi, Jobin. You see people like Kaushik also after a long time. So, yeah. uh, more on that later. But I just wanted to ask you uh, something about this uh, uh, polemical aspect that you mentioned, right? By the way, kind of. But the, it's not by the way, I think you, it's part, I think you had a very clear uh, plan behind uh, using that, uh, you know, polemical, the word, po you know, you had a pol polemical uh, thing to convey with you using this uh, idea of different cultures of mathematics. I was wondering if, you know, if we acknowledge these different cultures of mathematics, do you think that's going to be helpful to, uh, you know, mathematics education? That's one yeah. question I want to ask. Okay. And then, uh, second question is, you know, nowadays, mm -hmm. 
uh, is you know is programming sort of related to uh, mathematics uh, in some sense you know so you kind of indicated that it is and you know there is this uh, attempt to introduce coding i don't i want to just bring it to the real world and what's happening around us because i'm also a polemical kind of person so uh, you know uh, there's an attempt to introduce coding at a very young age you know maybe 6 or 9 or something like that do you have any uh, uh, reflections on that do you kind of see any connections you know this whole uh, thing of universality and you know a single way of viewing mathematics mm. and that yeah. is an indicator of intelligence and all that i know i'm going all the way all over the place yeah, yeah. i just wanted to see if you have thoughts on that no thanks jobin uh, very important points both of them particularly the question about uh, yeah i did use polemic because i'm trying to qualify myself you know protect myself in some sense because you know the moment you start of cultures and multiplicity of mathematics some people get a little bit worried uh, but the point is uh, i the main reason why i think these things matter why i even think about it as something worth trying to understand and worth talking about is in exactly for the reason you talk about which is that one of the biggest problems in maths teaching in maths education is the way in which it has excluded a very large number of people something which you have thought a lot about and mathematics particularly seems to be a cutting point for many people across uh, caste across gender into doing you know that the discipline or science entering science and so on and i have always been wondering about how you actually teach mathematics see, see either there is something called natural ability that we lost i mean i, I can't hear you sundar uh, yeah can you, we lost the last 10 seconds yeah sorry um you are talking about the ability yeah so i'll just uh, switch my connection and see okay it should be can you hear me now yes yes can you hear me yes yes sundar yeah uh, sundar we uh, yeah yeah, yeah. I, you look like can you i can you hear me now? yeah sorry no i was saying that the ability of yeah the, you know the a kind of so why is it that so people are not able to do mathematics is it because yeah okay i'm cutting uh, my video off so let's see if yeah, this yeah. works better yeah okay so continue okay so what i'm saying yeah so what i'm saying is that uh, either it is some innate ability in these children that they are not learning mathematics or that there are the ways of teaching mathematics are uh, wrong and i have always felt having you know always enjoyed teaching maths to kids eh, always informally that's one thing which i always been doing right from school days that i find it uh, impossible to believe that it is the lack of certain kind of cognitive capacity they have so what is this question about teaching that drives these uh, kids so much away so in fact as varun was saying my book philosophy for children has a whole chapter i mean although it's about reading writing thinking just making them understand these things i have a, a, a section on mathematics and just talking about mathematics and learning to think about mathematics as a language and what the implications are if it is a language and that's really what i've been trying to uh, push at so i totally agree with you that uh, part of the reason for making these kinds of polemical thing is um, uh, you know is to actually um really give more possibilities and be more inclusive in teaching and learning of mathematics the second point you are talking about um uh sorry i think cultures it is it's about programming you know teaching coding oh yeah teaching programming yeah you know uh, as i said although i enjoy math so much i am i always found uh, these computer languages so difficult to understand and learn and may not be because i didn't put my mind also into it but uh, there is a lot about computer languages which mimics one aspect of uh, mathematics but does not have the creativity of this mathematical imagination which as i said is about pictorial cognition a lot of mathematical uh, work is about pictorial cognition the pictures is not pictures of the world but pictures of symbols symbols appear as pictures which you can put jigsaw puzzles into each other and so on uh, the coding 
uses the linear logical narrative that is making conclusion from previous sentences right that inferential mechanism but uh, as far as in my limited knowledge does not have the capacity for this very rich engagement with symbolic manipulation that is present in mathematics <clears throat> all right yeah thank you Varun is um, muted. Bala, can you hear me? Bala, you want to go next? Sorry, sorry. Can you see me now? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay. Well, I can't see. I, I'm not sure I can see Sundar, but it's okay. I've seen him earlier. My connection was yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But uh, okay. Thank you, Sundar, for this. Uh, deep and fascinating analysis of uh, mathematics and also of mathematics in India. And for your case for pluralism in mathematics, you know, I think that's quite convincing and very interesting. And, but the question I want to raise is something quite specific that you mentioned about uh, uh, Professor Rodan Marasima that he saw Indian mathematics as algorithmic. Uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm representing you accurately. Now, but uh, I think you were at a conference where we were all together, where Professor Rodan Narasimha also presented a paper, where he talked about this notion of inverted axioms. You know, axioms that are derived not by intuition, but inferred in some sense. And the contrast he made here was between uh, algebra, which Descartes saw as something barbarous, because algebraic theorems and you know formulae and so on were not based on axiomatic self-evident principles, but you know, were developed ad hoc as kind of algorithms for computation. And, uh, and, and, and this path took Indian mathematics, you know, into all kinds of developments that were quite sophisticated in the algebraic direction, in number theory and so on. And he contrasted that with the, with the, with the Greek idea uh, of mathematics that was based on self-evident first principles in geometry. Uh, these geometric principles were universal. They could not be otherwise. Uh, they were certain. And, uh, and they were very few in number. And from these few, you could derive, you know, all the theorems. So most, of course, after Gerdau, that may not be true. But all the theorems of, of geometry. Now, but uh, Narasimha also argued, and I think this is very interesting, that modern mathematics is actually a bringing together uh, of both the Indian idea of inferred principles in mathematics with the idea of intuitive self-evident principles in geometry of the Greeks. And this came about in the 17th century, you know, uh, when the two were brought together and he introduced the notion, and I think this is something quite original with uh, Narasimha, the notion of inferred axioms. He said that in modern mathematics, what we have are uh, inferred axioms, a kind of a hybrid, you know, or, uh, combination of the two approaches. On the one hand, we have inferred principles, but they are not, you know, ad hoc or, you know, multiple principles. These inferred principles themselves are kind of uh, reduced to a few formal axioms from which we derive mathematics, which then becomes applicable to the world. I don't know if I'm being, you know, uh, uh, quite clear about this, but I thought that this idea is very interesting because it shows how you have 
uh, a coming together of two traditions of maths, where you suspend the idea of intuitive self-evident first principles, you reject that, you know, the Greek idea, but you keep the idea of deductivism and you keep the idea of uh, beginning this deductivism from very few principles. So there's a kind of an economy here, but mm -hmm. combine it with having these axioms, you know, as somehow derived from nature and uh, as computation rules or whatever you want to call them. And, and that modern maths is actually a synthesis <coughs> to a future. So I was just wondering what you think of uh, Rodem Narasimha's, you know, uh, framing of this, of modern mathematics in this way. Um, yeah, I mean, I've, um, you know, I mean, I think the original point, in, in, uh, the first thing which he had written on the axiomatic was actually uh, part of a special section I edited where a few of us wrote on different aspects of mathematics in general. That's where he first proposed, you know, discusses this example uh, we, and drawing on Fritz Stahl and others also in terms of Fritz Stahl's work on Euclid and Panini, uh, you know, that distinction. Yeah. Um, so in that context, the algorithmic was uh, seen as a particular methodological principle, which yeah. characterized, uh, you know, the calculations of astronomical calculations and so on. Um, I have not seen this piece of uh, this inferred axiom, uh, which you are mentioning in this, uh, this conference thing. But I would say that you know, I mean, I, I don't know if it's possible to generalize to a lot of the developments of uh, mathematics from calculus to complex analysis uh, to the, uh, yeah, you know, uh, non-Euclidean non geometry, Riemannian geometry, many of which grew without any notion of uh, even attempts to find axiomatic principles before developing the mathematics. And in fact, that's why even in the question of real analysis and so on, complex analysis, which come much later, after a very fertile use of it by mathematicians for decades or centuries in some cases. So uh, I, I, this question of the axiomatization uh, becomes, uh, you know, to me in terms of the practice of mathematics and also the practice of the application of mathematics seems to be uh, a post facto event in order to clean your house after a kind of a value has attached itself to that discipline. I, mean, I, I see this very clearly, of course, in applicability, but we also know that in many of these disciplines, like as I said in uh, calculus and Riemannian geometry, that this happens. So, um, yeah. Okay, but I'm very surprised you say you haven't seen this approach. Uh proposed by Rodham Narasimha, because yeah. it is in this volume, you know, oh, it is in our, <laughs> where you yeah. have a chapter, yeah. you know, the chapter two on philosophical implications of connected histories of science. Yes. Yeah. And this is exactly the same volume where Narasimha writes about Barbara's algebra inferred axioms. In okay, great. Yeah. Echoes in the rise of Western exact science. So maybe, you know, it might require revisiting. <laughs> no, yeah, I will. Thank you so much, Bala. But you know why? Yeah. There's a good reason why. Because yeah. like some of my books with some of my students have taken, it hasn't come back to me after I received <laughs> it. So now I have to track it down. And yeah, I will. But it's yeah. glad you pointed that out. Yeah. I will follow up on In that. In fact, your two ideas connect very well. I thought, okay. You know. Okay, good. So, yeah. Thank um, you. Yeah, uh, Sundar, there is a question in the chat box um, by Rahul Krishna Kumar. Um, I will read out, read it out. Um, what are your thoughts on the discoveries of mathematics in the web, which were already done by Indian mathematicians centuries ago, but not given credit popularly? Example: power series expansion and digits of pi. Does this support the argument of pluralism and raises the question of Eurocentrism? This particular point is about Eurocentrism. Um, but the fact of trying to understand how they did what they did in their power series expansion and uh, expansion for pi, uh, that is about pluralism in trying to see the different set of uh, mathematical uh, ways of doing mathematics, which gave those, uh, those experiments. But this particular point about 
not getting uh, credit, etc. Or, for example, Pell's equation itself is a very good example of work done much earlier in by Indian mathematicians, but which is named much later by a British mathematician. So, yeah, that is. Uh, but my interest is actually in this case not on the Eurocentrism part, but on trying to understand are there multiple ways of doing some of these things. Yes. Um, if there are no further questions, um, if I mean, like Kundar has been talking for the last two hours. Yeah, uh, if there are any quick questions, we can take it up. But uh, if not, um, thanks everyone. We can end this lecture. Um, thanks everyone for uh, yeah taking time and uh, coming for this wonderful lecture and sharing your thoughts. And um, yeah. Uh, Antara, you want to? Yeah, I'll I'll just uh, thank Sundar on behalf of the department for a very fascinating talk uh, once more. And uh, since this is the last talk of the series, I I just uh, like to take this opportunity to uh, actually thank all of the participants who have uh, some of them have turned up quite uh, regularly and for all your enthusiasm and uh, participation. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank Varun for uh, uh, taking the initiative of organizing this. And uh, we hope to see you again in future department events. Thank you so much, thank Santra you. and Varun. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. And, and lovely uh, you. series. Yeah. yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks, everyone. Have a Bye. good night and a good morning, depending on. Bye.